This often overlooked mineral can help you build your hormone levels, protect your bone, as well as help reduce inflammation in your joints. Tune in tonight as we talk about boron. You unlock this door with the key of compassion. Beyond it is another world, a world of science, a world of common sense, a world of sanity. You're moving into a land of both empathy and ethics, of nutritional knowledge and empowerment. You've just crossed over into Dr. Osborne's zone. Welcome to Dr. Osborne's zone. Today we're talking all about boron, this crash course on a very important mineral that is very rarely discussed. So what is boron? It is a trace mineral. Now in humans, it's technically not been considered essential, meaning um, scientists have not confirmed it's essential in the human diet, although most scientists believe that that is just a matter of time before they confirm that. We do know, however, it's essential for plants. Again, the essentiality is uh, I, in my opinion, pending for humans. Now it's found in all tissues of the human body and the highest concentrations are in your fingernails, your bones, as well as your teeth. Now some interesting facts about boron. It was originally used as a food preservative. You've ever heard of borax, otherwise known as sodium borate, in the 1870s, but was banned by the 1950s as a preservative due to gut and digestive problems. Too much of it could cause nausea and intestinal discomfort and pain. But beyond that, boron's got some pretty very important key functions in the body. And probably the most well studied one has to do with bone growth and bone health. And we'll talk more about that here in just a minute. There's also some interesting research on wound healing. Some researchers in France have found using a 3% boric acid topically, and this is, this is not orally, so you know some of you um, thinking about how to take boron possibly, but these researchers in their, in their hospital were using a 3% solution on wounds in patients and finding that, um, and at least in their research, that using uh, boric acid reduced hospitalization time threefold. In other words, their, their patients using this solution were in the hospital three times uh, less as far as time is concerned than people not using it. So they found it to be actually quite a superior application post-surgically. We also know that boron modulates hormones, especially estrogen and testosterone. We'll talk more about that here in just a minute. But there's also research on boron where uh, it's been shown to enhance or to improve magnesium absorption. As well, boron has any inflammatory effects. Some studies show that boron helps to upregulate this specialized antioxidant system called superoxide dismutase, especially as it is in red blood cells. So for the protection of red blood cells. And then we have it as a, again, as an antioxidant. Again, any inflammatory SOD is an antioxidant that has any inflammatory properties. And then protection against pesticide and heavy metals. We know that boron aids in the production of SAMI. If you've not heard of SAMI, this is commonly used as a tool to lower a chemical called homocysteine. And you, you may have heard me talk about homocysteine in the past, but homocysteine elevations when homocysteine is elevated, it's, it, it increases the risk for cardiovascular disease, bone loss, certain types of cancer, as well as diabetes. So you don't want high levels of homocysteine. Now, if you wonder whether you have that, you can ask your doctor to check it. Insurance covers it. It's a simple blood test. But boron aids in the production of SAMI and the regulation of it. Also aids in the production of NAD. NAD uh, stands for nicotine adenine dinucleotide. What that basically is, is it's, in a sense, it's vitamin B3, otherwise known as niacin. So aiding uh, in both of these, in, in, the, in the production of SAMI as well as, as uh, NAD. We also know it has a role in preventative, and in some cases now they're even experimenting with treatment for certain types of cancers. So boron 
a lot of diversity with this mineral, as you'll see. Let's dive into some of the research around some of these things. So let's blow this up. You can see one of the, one of the uh, researchers responsible for a lot of the information and why we understand boron so well, and I just want to call out this individual. If you look up boron in medical literature, you're going to find this guy's name, Forrest Nielsen, uh, PhD. But uh, so just a shout out to him for such great work. But growing evidence from a variety of experimental models show that boron is a bioactive and beneficial, perhaps essential. And again, here's that keyword, perhaps essential. I said earlier, it not yet has not yet been delineated as an essential nutrient for humans. But um, most scientists think that it, it probably is just a matter of time. Um, reported beneficial actions of boron include arthritis alleviation. So if you've got arthritis, specifically this is in, in reference to osteoarthritis, as well as a um, risk of reduction. So, so again, arthritis alleviation, but also the re reduction or risk for the development of osteoarthritis. And then as well, bone growth and maintenance, central nervous system function, cancer risk reduction, hormone facilitation, and immune response, inflammation and oxidative stress modulation. So a lot of different components as we've already discussed. Boron intake should be greater than one milligram a day. Um, and I, I point that out because we're going to get into some dosing here shortly, but you can see here many people consume less than this amount, thus a low boron intake should be considered a health concern overall. Now, how many of you have gone to your doctor where they've checked, you know, your boron levels? If you've had diseases like osteoarthritis or cancer or bone loss, how many of you get your boron checked? Raise your hand uh, in the chat room if your doctors have measured your boron. Now, if they haven't, which is probably most of you, probably nobody will, will stand up to say their doctors measured their boron unless they're, you know, seeing me in my clinic or another doctor like me. But um, it's just not commonly done. Now, you can see here the pivotal role of boron supplementation on bone health. Uh, so this is, and again, in relationship to bone health, this is a review of, of the number of studies. So the studies considered in this narrative review have evaluated the positive effectiveness of bone in humans through control of calcium, vitamin D, and sex steroid hormone metabolism, considering a dietary supplementation of three milligrams a day. So again, there's this amount because that's a common question. Uh, as I showed you a moment ago, one of the world leading experts in boron says at least consuming one milligram a day, but in this case of, of bone health, three milligrams a day of boron alone or with other nutrients, this supplementation is demonstrably useful to support bone health in order to prevent and maintain adequate bone mineral density, also considering the daily dose of three milligrams is much lower than the upper level indicated uh, by EFSA in the daily dose of 10 milligrams. So, so again, um, three milligrams is kind of a general recommendation based on a lot of the review studies um, where, where they're looking at dosing of boron and the upper limit, which I'll show you here shortly, is much, much higher than that. So generally very, very safe uh, for consideration of, of uh, supplementing at, at three milligrams a day. Now let's talk about some of the hormone regulation functions of boron. So you can see the effect of dietary boron on minerals, estrogen, testosterone, metabolism in postmenopausal women. Down here, these findings suggest that supplementation of low boron diet with an amount of boron commonly found in diets, which again, we keep coming back to that, which is at least one milligram a day, uh, in fruits, vegetables, induces changes in postmenopausal women consistent with the prevention of calcium loss and bone demineralization. So again, if you're a female, you've been to your doctor, you've had a bone scan or other testing done, and you've been told you have osteoporosis, very, very important that you consider looking at boron and making sure you're getting adequate quantities. And I would even go so far as to ask your doctor, don't ask your doctor if it's right for you to have your, your boron measured. If you've got a diagnosis, ask your doctor to measure your boron um, and, and get that determined and figured out. And that way you can get on some type of supplementation protocol. Now, here's another research study on 
the effects of daily, weekly boron supplementation on steroid hormones, and this, and as well as something called pro-inflammatory cytokines. And so in this study, um, supplementation showed a significant de decrease on sex hormone binding globulin, um, SHBG, which we'll talk about in just a minute, so keep that in your mind, as well as high sensitivity C-reactive protein and TNF-alpha. Now, HSCRP and TNF Alpha are two chemical compounds commonly used or commonly measured by doctors to, um, to measure systemic inflammation in patients. And so again, these are blood tests that you can generally request. But in this case of, of, of this study, using boron supplementally reduced CRP, in essence reduced the inflammatory load, but also reduced TNF alpha, again, uh, two markers of inflammation. And this was just uh, in short term. So this actually happened in a six hour supplementation regimen. So the way this, this study was done is they, uh, is they gave these individuals uh, a heavy dose of boron, I believe it was 10 milligrams, and then collected their blood every two hours and watched uh, these values decline. Um, but also in this study, because they did, it was a study done where they used acute doses of, of boron, but then they also structured the dosing over a week, over seven days. And in that, um, they found an increase in testosterone. So taking boron increased testosterone in men um, and reduced inflammation, which I think we could all say, you know, especially those of you maybe men that have low testosterone, that would be a good thing. Um, you know, again, relatively easy to do. Boron is, is inexpensive to buy and it's very safe to take. And even if it doesn't work, it's certainly not hurting you. Now, here we've got a, um, a, a just a general diagram. And I wanted to show you the impact um, of how testosterone is actually produced. So this is this, this diagram is showing kind of the production of testosterone and the different micronutrients or the different vitamins and minerals that play a role in the production and regulation of testosterone. So, you know, if we follow this through, the, the, you have this area of your brain called the hypothalamus that produces a hormone called GnRH, gonadotrophic uh, releasing hormone. And then that goes to the anterior, to anterior pituitary gland, which then asks that gland to release a hormone called LH, luteinizing hormone. And then that hormone goes to the testes and um, causes or in, it influences the generation of testosterone. So it helps to improve and, and create testosterone. And remember, testosterone is generated or produced by cholesterol. So cholesterol is kind of the precursor. It's the mother element involved in generating or producing testosterone. Now you also have zinc up here playing a role, a positive influential role on the generation of testosterone as well. So zinc is important. You can also see magnesium over here on this side and boron right here, I've got it highlighted in blue. Um, both play a role in reducing this structure right here. Remember I told you I'd come back to this SHBG, that stands for sex hormone binding globulin. Well, SHBG does what it, it sounds like it does. It binds hormones. And in this case, we're talking about testosterone, but it can also bind estrogen. So ladies, this, we don't want high levels of SHBG. And again, this is, goes for men and women. And this is a, a simple blood test you can ask your doctor to measure. A lot of times what happens is people go to their doctor and doctors measure your estrogen, they may measure your testosterone, but they don't measure this. And the problem with that is if you have high levels, high levels of SHBG, even if you have normal levels of estrogen or progesterone, having high levels of this um, protein, binding protein, will reduce the active amount of hormones circulating in your blood that your body is capable of using. So in effect, it lowers uh, the functional capacity of your testosterone or of your estrogen. So we don't want high levels of this chemical right here. And what I'm showing you is that boron and magnesium have a regulatory role in making sure that you're not making too much SHBG. So if you've ever been to your doctor and you've, and you've had this measured, the takeaway is if you have high levels, you might consider boron, 
You also might consider magnesium supplementation. Now, what did I say earlier about magnesium? I said that boron helps to improve magnesium absorption. So again, there's a kind of a positive loop between boron and magnesium as well, but the combined action of these two helps to free up your total free level of, te in this case, testosterone, so that that can go about doing its job. Remember, testosterone, um, once it's free and active, it, it binds to cells, and then it goes and it attaches to the DNA, and it upregulates certain genes to bring about certain um, anabolic or stimulatory effects that we want. And one of these effects is building bone, um, and this is in regulating bone health, and but also regulating muscle health and regulating the breakdown of fat tissue. So we need testosterone to stay lean and thin and well-muscled, but also to have good bone density. And this is one of the reasons why boron plays a role in bone health. It's through its regulation of, of making your testosterone bioavailable. Now, it does the same thing with estrogen. And remember that estrogen also, especially estradiol, also very, very important for bone health in women. This is one of the reasons why some doctors like to prescribe bioidentical estrogen hormone replacement therapy in women with osteoporosis. And I would say this is maybe especially be of concern in women who have had hysterectomies, uh, either total hysterectomies or partial hysterectomies where, you know, where you've reduced your capacity to generate uh, your own estrogen through a surgical means. Now, so again, all that to get to this, to get to this SHBG, because we know boron, you know, again, can reduce the overproduction of that particular protein, thus making your free testosterone more bioavailable to do its work on the bone, but also on fat loss, weight loss, and other components of anabolic health. Okay, one of the other effects of boron uh, and this was this uh, interesting article published in a journal called Medical Hypothesis. But um, the um, the thought here was that boron has an upregulatory impact um, on 25 hydroxy vitamin D, which is the form of vitamin D, 25 OHD. So if you're ever going to your doctor, you can ask him to run this test, 25 OHD is a blood test, and this is measuring your vitamin D level. And it's been shown that boron, because of its an inhibition of an enzyme, a specialized enzyme called 24-hydroxylase, um, that it preserves vitamin D. It preserves your vitamin D, your, your circulating form of vitamin D, from actually breaking down. So in some people who are vitamin D resistant, meaning they've been supplementing with vitamin D, but their levels are just not coming up um, the way that they should, there's this uh, suspicion that it could very well be a boron uh, being too low, thus uh, not impacting this enzyme to, to basically preserve vitamin D levels. We also uh, have studies that suggest that uh, nutritional boron can upregulate 17 beta estradiol levels in, in, in a similar fashion. So this is estradiol, right? So again, what we were talking about a minute ago with, with estrogen, right? Estradiol, which is e also known as E2, which is the active form of estrogen, the, the, pr the predominantly active form of estrogen that does most of the work. So again, boron has a sparing effect on estradiol levels, but also on vitamin D levels. So in both cases, we've got now three, really, because we think of vitamin D, most people think of it as a vitamin, but really it's a pro-hormone. So we know boron has a regulatory effect on not only estrogen, but also testosterone, now also vitamin D. So all pretty important functions because those uh, hormones and nutrients have major, major roles across the board. Now, all that being said, there are a number of different diseases um, that have been associated with boron deficiency and cancer being a big one. So in, in, in the case of cancer, prostate, cervical, as well as lung cancers have been linked to boron deficiency. We've also got osteoporosis, as we mentioned, many, many, many mechanisms of regulation with osteoporosis, right? There's a, a calcium, a magnesium, vitamin D, and then boron itself, um, important for the matrix of bone. So these things all important for bone health as well as arthritis. Studies show that boron supplementation actually reduces pain, but also um, can reduce the risk of the development of arthritis 
in the joints. Oh, let's back up here. Got a couple of studies to show you on this. So you see here the essential essentiality of boron for healthy bones and joints. In this study, um, 19, since 1963, evidence has accumulated that suggests boron is safe and effective treatment for some forms of arthritis. You see down here, the initial evidence was that boron supplementation alleviated arthritic pain and discomfort. Uh, it was followed by findings from numerous other observations, epidemiological and controlled animal and human experiments, uh, to include these, these different things, the findings. So one, analytical evidence of lower boron concentrations in femur heads, bones, and synovial fluid, fluid from people with arthritis than from those without. So in other words, they looked at the concentration of boron in the actual bone, the femurs, the head, uh, the tip of the hip, uh, the hip bone, the um, other bones as well, but also the synovial fluid. In people with arthritis, they had lower concentrations of boron than people without arthritis. So that was one observation. The second observation is evidence that bones of patients using boron supplements are much harder to cut than those of patients not using boron supplements. So that, that also an interesting uh, observation. And then number three, epidemiological evidence that in areas of the world where boron intakes uh, usually are one milligram or less per day, we go back to that number, right? One milligram or less per day, the estimated incidence of arthritis ranges from 20 to 70%. Whereas in areas of the world where boron intakes are usually three to 10 milligrams, the estimated incidence of arthritis ranges from zero to 10%. I mean, th those are whopping numbers. And then we have experimental evidence from a double-blind placebo-controlled boron supplementation trial of patients with osteoarth osteoarthritis, a significant favorable response to a six milligram boron a day dose supplement was obtained. 50% of subjects receiving the supplement improved compared to only 10% receiving the placebo. So again, in this study, six milligrams of boron per day, half the study participants improved over placebo. That's, that's pretty profound when you consider the alternative. What are the alternatives to, um, to arthritis or arthritis medications? So you have drugs like NSAIDs, and then you have drugs like acetaminophen, which are, you know, these are the over-the-counter remedies for pain for joint pain that any, you know, most people will generally buy. NSAIDs would include drugs like ibuprofen and aspirin, naproxen, et cetera. And then um, acetamin would include drugs like Tylenol. But you know, your NSAIDs, what do they do? They damage the gut lining, causing um, vitamin C and iron reduction or deficiencies. And of course you need both vitamin C and iron for healthy joints as well. So I mean, you're treating the pain while increasing nutritional deficiencies that can create the very thing you're trying to treat. And with acetaminophen, the, you know, the big problem here is that it causes glutathione deficiency, which can lead to liver problems. You know, and it, you know, that comes with its a whole host of different types of issues. And then beyond the over-the-counter, so again, these are over-the-counter options for arthritis, but what are your other options? I mean, you, you've got other really, really strong pain medications, the opiate class of medications, which, you know, hopefully none of you are treating your arthritis with that, but I, I wouldn't be surprised to see many doctors writing these scripts uh, for people that they shouldn't be writing them for, but I mean, those types of drugs are horrific. I mean, aside from the risk of addiction, the, they shut down the GI tract, causing the severity of constipation and other health problems. So not really a great, uh, a great option on any of these fronts, but you know, what can we do? We can, we can go to something as simple as boron. And you know, again, in the study, I showed you 50% of the patients improved. So only at six milligrams a day, which is, you know, pretty safe to do. Um, all you have to do is try it. I would encourage any of you struggling, um, trying to look for a natural alternative. I would consider using that boron as a, as a potential to aid and support your joints. Uh, we also have this one, boron containing compounds as a preventative for chemotherapeutic agents for cancer. So as, min as, as I mentioned earlier, cancer, um, you can see here types of cancers most frequently impacted by boron containing compounds include the prostate, breast, cervical, and lung 
cancers. Mechanisms involving boron activity on cancer cells are based on the inhibition of a variety of enzymatic activities, including serine proteases, NAD dehydrogenases, mRNA splicing, and cell division, but also receptor binding mimicry and the introduct or the induction of apoptosis. Apoptosis being uh, the term for programmed cell death. So this is where your cells kill themselves, commit suicide. This mechanism is how we fight cancer, or one of the preliminary or one of the primary mechanisms of, of how we fight cancer. And then boron enriched diets resulted in significant decrease in the risk for prostate and cervical cancer and decrease in lung cancer in smoking women. Boron-based compounds show promising effects for the chemotherapy of specific forms of cancer, but due to specific benefits, should also be included in cancer, cancer chemotherapy or preventative strategies. So those of you with cancer, talk to your doctor as to whether or not supplementing with boron might be right for you. You know, or don't talk to your doctor and do it anyway. Um, the good news about boron supplementation is there are no known interactions with drugs. So again, very, very safe uh, to take it. Uh, you know, any, anything really under 10 milligrams a day is really safe to take um, without any known, known, any known drug interactions uh, or problems. Now, how can we eat more boron? Because that's going to be important too. And this is, um, you know, a lot of times I pick on plant-based diets, you guys might hear me sometimes sound like I'm biased more toward heavier meat than plant, and that's not true. I'm more of an, of an equal opportunist, meaning I think we should eat plants, I think we should also eat animal tissue, and I don't think we should just strive for one or the other. Uh, I think some people have had success on either side of that equation, but I think the vast majority of folks need both. And boron is one of those examples where you don't get a lot of boron in meat. So if you really want to get a good amount of boron in your diet, I've got a list here of different foods that are highest in boron. And you'll notice the trend here is these are all plant-based foods, right? So avocado, apricot, currant, prune, raisin, peaches, grapes, apples, pears, red kidney beans, lentils, almonds, etc., cetera, and a number of other nuts over here on the far right. And then um, one or two give you kind of just some how much is in these foods, right? So if you look here, um, this is a great research review that uh, published kind of a chart explaining how much boron was typically found in a serving of these different foods. And so you can see um, in this diagram, avocado very high, uh, two milligrams of boron in a, in a typical serving. Apricots, half a milligram. Currants, 0.26. Grapes, 0.5, etc. You see down here, red kidney beans, almost two. So Again, the, the problem is, as many of you are, are gluten sensitive, if you're listening to my show, you know, we talk about gluten all the time, and a lot of you are gluten sensitive, and not that any of these foods contain gluten, but many people with gluten issues have digestive struggles. Their gut's damaged, and they don't do real well with eating a lot of lentils or bean-based foods because they're, they're hard to digest, and if your gut's already damaged from years of gluten exposure, that, that damage makes it really hard to tolerate these types of foods. So many of you don't tolerate those. So um, just be aware of that and look at some of these others as an option. Now you'll see down here on the bottom that wine also, uh, Shiraz wine uh, contains a lot of, of, um, of boron as well, but this is not wine that I really, I would say I don't, I don't really recommend trying to drink a glass of wine every night to get your boron uh, for, for reasons that alcohol is toxic and causes uh, nutritional loss. So my, in my opinion, trying to obtain it from alcohol would be a bad idea, but nonetheless, it does have boron in it. Okay, should you supplement? Possibly yes. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of this. Get tested, right? Get tested, ask your doctor to test you. Um, because by getting tested, not, not only will you have a baseline, but then you'll have a way to measure as you go forward in the future the effectiveness of your supplementation and, and the potential as well to reduce the risk of any kind of toxicity that could come. Although, bor uh, although boron is, is relatively safe and non-toxic, you know, with, with, um, with reasonable doses, um, again, getting tested, everybody's different. Everybody's unique in that regard. So getting tested might be very, very helpful. Now, three milligrams a day is generally really, really safe. A lot of studies show that anything, so kind of staying under 10 milligrams a day is really safe to do. 
Now, if you look at, um, this is from National Institute of Health uh, in their um, dietary supplementation, upper limits. So you can see the tolerable upper, upper intake levels for boron if you're 19 years of age or older is 20 milligrams a day. Um, and that's both for male and female. And you can see for teenagers, you know, it's 17. And then for nine to 13, it's 11 milligrams a day. For four to eight year olds, six milligrams a day. One to three year old, three milligrams a day. And then, you know, for seven to 12 months, there's no established upper safe, upper uh, intake. So there's no real data that they have that they share. Um, although they do have this little, you can see down here, uh, breast milk formula and uh, food should be the only sources of boron for infants. So if you're talking about infants, um, they don't really recommend any kind of supplementation. So that would be the, you know, these two groups right here. But if you're an adult, 20 milligrams a day, look, if you're, if you're like most Americans, your diet is going to contain approximately one milligram a day. And, um, you know, you got 19, so you've, you've got an upper intake level of up to 20. Uh, most people get one a day. So if you're staying around 10 a day, most of the research studies on arthritis and bone loss and regulation of hormones is somewhere in that uh, 5 to 10 milligram range. So again, if you're trying to get therapeutic benefit from using boron, that's a, a pretty safe place to be. But as, as I mentioned earlier, it's always a good idea to be tested. Uh, and to be monitored. Now, let's talk if, you know, if you're on it, you know, these are things you can pay attention to. So, um, is there a toxic level? Yeah, there can be. And so, generally speaking, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, most of this is GI tract symptoms, right? Skin rash can also occur as well as lethargy, uh, you know, which is a generalized fatigue, and then accelerated loss of vitamin B2 in the urine. So, if you're, if you are being tested, you know, this is one of those where you might see your B2 start to drop and, you know, B2 deficiency will cause something called photophobia and something else called chelation, I'm sorry, chelosis, which is basically chapping of the lips. And so if you're on boron for a long period of time and you've been popping, you know, 10 milligrams a day and you start becoming really, really sensitive to bright light, you start, your lips start getting really, really chapped, you might consider that you're taking enough to deplete or to cause an accelerated excretion of vitamin B2, which could lead to those symptoms. But again, also paying attention to some of these other symptoms as well. So if you're going to take it in higher doses, it's never a bad idea to measure it, never a bad idea to monitor it, never a bad idea to know what are the potential symptoms that you might experience uh, should you be getting too much of it in you. So if you've got questions about boron, leave them below and make sure you join us for live Q&As every Thursday night. Thanks so much for tuning in to Dr. Osborne's Zone. Thanks for tuning in to the Dr. Osborne Zone. Don't forget to share, like, and subscribe for more content like this. And make sure you come back next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time and Thursday at noon 30 for more episodes.